of visionary dreamers and doers and called by God to live, to love, to serve. We live, we love, we serve. Amen. Listen, we're wrapping up our series on the secret of celebrating you. Our first weekend, you remember we talked about one of the reasons that makes celebrating ourselves difficult, and that is the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome is really when, when we have competency but lack confidence and we downplay our significance and our giftedness. Then on week two, we talked about another thing that, well, two things that hinder us from celebrating ourselves, guilt and shame. Guilt and shame. How many of us have been stunted by guilt and buried by shame? Guilt is connected to the things we do. Shame is when you start believing certain narratives about yourself, where you actually think the things that you do that you're not proud of are synonymous with who you are. And then on last Sunday, <clears throat> we had a time. We talked about celebrating ourselves with that sermon, I am committed to my joy. How committed are you to your joy? Because the truth is, it is hard to celebrate yourself if you cannot celebrate life, if you cannot celebrate just being. And joy is about making a choice every day, and every day you have to choose joy. And what? Keep on choosing it. You keep on choosing it. And today, I want to come at something a different way as we close out this series on the secret of celebrating you and yourself. I want to look at the last psalm in the book of Psalms, a familiar one, Psalm 150. And I want to look at it a little different today, uh, but I think it is appropriate for closing out, closing out this series and using to close it out, the closing out psalm, Psalm 150, called the doxology of doxologies, the praise of praise. And so here it is. I'm reading Psalm 150, the entire psalm, six verses from the New Revised Standard Version of Scripture. And you can read along with me. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, beloved, let's pray. God, we bless your name on today and we honor you, O oh God, for the significance of just being in this moment. God, we are here. We are here and we are alive. And for that, oh God, we say thank you. Thank you, God. Every day we open our eyes, we're amazed by you. And so God, in this season where we are leaning into celebration, God, remind us, oh God, that we have more than enough reasons every day to rejoice. God, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Now, oh God, do whatever you need to do in this time that we share together, that we share virtually. Do whatever you need to do, wherever you need to do it, to get the glory, oh God. And we will honor you and worship you because you, oh God, are more than worthy. And we will demonstrate our commitment to you by the love we show for one another. So, God, thank you. Thank you. This is our prayer. In your name we pray. Amen. I want to read that again, Psalm 150. 
Beginning at verse 1, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with string and pipe. Praise him with clanging cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, I want to challenge you today in this sermon title. I want to speak this morning from the subject, I'm going to praise God for me. I'm going to praise God for me. Amen? Amen, beloved. This psalm is the culminating psalm in the book of Psalms. It is appropriate that the end of the book of Psalms, the book of songs, the book that celebrate God would end with a psalm of complete Praise. In fact, the word praise appears in this psalm some 13 times. It is considered, again, the doxology of doxologies, the benediction of benedictions, the closing of closings. It is as if the psalmist is saying that everything expressed in the book of Psalms, the struggle, the strife, the enemies, the battles, the warfare, the victories, everything culminates to a moment of praise. And in some ways, that belief, I think, kind of shapes how we ought to be thinking that everything we go through may not seem praiseworthy at the time, but our capacity and ability to get through everything that get, comes our way helps us understand the significance of what it means to praise and honor God. This psalm, again, is completely and utterly about celebrating God. And I love the psalm because it's very clear. It gives some very clear directives. If you look at verses 1 through 6, it is very clear on what we ought to be doing in this moment filled with praise because God, in many ways, I saw this the other day, is praiseable. God is praise able, praiseable. Here it is. The psalmist writes from the very beginning where we praise God. The psalmist says we praise God in his sanctuary. We praise God in the mighty of his firmament. In other words, underneath the skies, we praise God. No matter where we are, we praise God. That's the where. There's no specific place designated to honor God. There's no right place, no accurate place. When you begin to think about God and think about who you are and think about how you are, no matter where you are, it's always the right place to praise God. So the writer says, we praise God in the sanctuary, but just in case you think we only do it there, we praise God under the sky, under the heavens. We praise God under the firmament. And not only where we praise God, but why we praise God. Verse 2, we praise God for God's mighty deeds. We praise God according to his surpassing greatness. It's quite simple. We praise God where? In the sanctuary, under the skies. Why? Because of God's mighty deeds, because of God's surpassing greatness, you and I, our lives are testimonies to the mighty deeds and surpassing greatness of God. But the writer doesn't stop there. He moves from where to praise God, why we praise God, to then how we praise God to me. He said, praise God with the trumpet sound. Praise God with the lute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with clanging symbols. Praise God with loud clashing symbols. In other words, I like this part. Praising God is not just a verbal exercise. When you praise God, your entire being ought to be engaged in the act of praise. I hope you get this. Your entire being, everything about you, he says it with tambourine and cymbals and trumpets and dance. Every fiber of your being ought to be engaged in the act of praise. And I know there's some folk who say, things like pastor I don't really praise like that I'm more reserved no hold on the psalmist made it clear when you think about God surpassing greatness and God's great deeds in your life how do
do you sit still? How do you keep your cool? I'm only speaking for myself. When I begin to think about the ways God has made in my life and the doors God has opened and the grace I've been afforded, it's difficult to sit still on my praise. It's difficult to be quiet with what God has done. Every ounce of me wants to shout about how God has been in my life. My hands want to praise God. My feet want to praise God. My arms want to praise God. Every fiber of my being wants to gather together as a symphony and an orchestra and a choir of resounding praise because of God's mighty acts, because of God's great deeds. It tells you where. It tells you why. It tells you how. And then it tells you who. Let everything that has breath, I hope you hear this today, let everything that breathes manufacture a reason to give God praise. Everything that breathes, everything created will find a way to give God praise. The waves make a sound of rejoicing. The ocean rumbles with celebration. The trees sway in adoration. The birds sing in magnification. And yet you and I who are made in the likeness and image of God, we can never be still in that moment when we think that we've been fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. There's nothing that should keep us still. Jesus put it this way. If you don't praise, the rocks will cry out. And if oceans know how to praise and birds know how to praise and the sun knows how to bow and the sun and the moon knows how to bow. And if everything that God has created finds a way to make a reverberating sound in glorification of their creativity, then you and I have no choice but to give God praise right where you are right now. You ought to find a way. I don't care what it is. I don't care where you are. You ought not be ashamed to give God praise. You might be in some restaurant right now. You might be sitting around some friends right now. I don't know where you are, but you ought to right now not be ashamed to give God praise. Imagine if God was ashamed of us. Imagine if God wasn't gracious to us. Imagine if God wasn't merciful to us. But because God looked beyond your faults every time and God made ways every time, you ought to give God praise. Let everything that can breathe praise God. I remember years ago when I was pastoring in North Carolina, there was one of the church mothers. We called her Ma Britt. She was 89 years old. And I'm going to tell you, there was nobody in the church who could outpraise Ma Britt with her frail body, walking her cane, and she could barely move around at times. Well, my God, when the music started going and she started testifying, because every Sunday she would testify during devotional, and when she started testifying, she would instinctively start dancing in her own little way, and she would start praising God, and she was quiet and reserved. But when she started reflecting on those 89 years and how God had kept her and allowed her to raise other people's children, even though God had not given her children of her own, when she was a mother to a church and a mother on her block and a mother in her family. She would give God praise. And she said, no matter what's going on, she would say, baby, I'm going to give God praise. And she told me one time, she said, I'm going to die praising God. And I got to let you know, I was there when mom Britt died. And mom Britt died, I hope you catch this, with her mouth open. Oh, my God. She died literally with her mouth open. She died trying to make the gesture to give God praise. And she had resolved in her spirit, she was going to leave here with a shame out because God had been amazing in her life. Now I want you to think about this beloved. If the why of praising God is God's mighty acts and God's surpassing deeds then that means that we're giving God praise for the things that God has done. And can I just add this for a second I won't be long. But one of the things that God has done is God made you. God created you. Let that sink in for a second because the psalmist is suggesting that part of the rationale for our praise is reflecting on God's deeds and acts. And part of God's deeds and acts is breathing life into us. In other words, 
if I can praise God for what God has done, and I'm one of the products of God's creativity and imagination, then that means at some point, I got to be able to praise God for me, for making me, for creating me. I know there are a thousand reasons I can find for not celebrating God, but those reasons will never outweigh God's creativity and imagination, beloved, when God made you. Isn't it amazing how we can praise God? God blessed me with a new job and God blessed me with a relationship and God blessed me with a family and God blessed me with a home and, and all these things we start listing. How many times when you list the things that you are grateful to God for, do you put your name on the list? Do you say, God, I thank you for me, for me, for being here. And I'm not talking about the quality of your life in terms of what you've done or what you've accomplished or the mistakes you've made. All those things are part of the circumstances of our living. But to be able to fundamentally say, God, I today want to celebrate you because you made me. I celebrate you, God, because you made me. And sometimes we forget the significance of our own being and our own breathing, and we forget to celebrate ourselves. I know we've been talking about this for several weeks now, reasons we need to celebrate and ways we need to celebrate. But at the end of the day, we are a reflection of God's creativity and handiwork. If I can sit there and be amazed by that ocean, blown away by the ebb and flow of the waves, humbled in the presence of a beautiful rose. If I can find ways to pause, reflect, be still, and honor and glorify God for the things I've seen around that are reflections of God, how come I can't do that for myself? There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with celebrating you. And there's nothing wrong with thanking God for yourself not for yourself, but for yourself. When you can acknowledge that because it is good, it is life, it is healing, it gives you vitality, the capacity to celebrate you, not be held captive or intoxicated by your flaws, but celebrate your very being. Here's what I've discovered. Conscious acknowledgments of your accomplishments, large or small, it's acceptance of who you are and the things you've done and where you are right now and how far you've come. It means giving yourself permission to fall in love with you. When you can acknowledge what you've done, great or small, acknowledge your very being, acknowledge what you've come through, no matter what it is, it is a way to honor God but also honor yourself, beloved. I hope you hear this today because there's so many of us who don't do it, who don't celebrate ourselves. And when we celebrate ourselves, I said it last week, it is gratitude that gives birth to joy and you have so much to be grateful for. But the one thing you ought to be grateful for is you. When you put down that list of the things you're grateful for, when you put that gratitude list together, I want to help you. I want to make sure that the first thing you put down on the top of that list is, God, thank you for me. Because you did something amazing when you made me. Can you say that and be honest? God, you did something amazing when you made me. Have you ever said that? Have you ever spoken those words to God? God, thank you because you did something amazing when you made me. Let that be your chorus for this Sunday. God, you did something amazing when you made me me. And I'm not talking, God, about the things I've done that cause guilt and shame. 
I'm not talking about my accomplishments necessarily, the things that I think define me. I'm just talking about for my very being, for my very presence. God, you did something amazing when you made me. Beloved, when you celebrate yourself, it allows you to heal from the belief that we or you are not enough. When you celebrate yourself, it allows you to heal from thinking that you are unworthy. To begin thinking that you are worthy of every single accomplishment and every single good thing that comes your way. I said a few weeks back that sometimes it calls for a linguistic shift. It calls for a change of perspective because too often people make us feel as though somehow to celebrate ourselves and to pause and to thank God for making us and to acknowledge how amazing we are. Somehow that's connected to conceit or arrogance. But can I tell you something? When you have been beaten down by life in such a way where you begin to think that you are not worthy of the best that God has for you, if you've been wounded in such a way that you are always inundated with feelings of, of low self self-esteem and self-doubt and worthlessness when you are the person who's often thinking and has often found yourself dwelling on your inadequacies and the things about you that you've labeled as flaws and mistakes when you're that person and you've lived that life can I tell you how much courage it takes to change your perspective and to start celebrating yourself do you know how much courage it takes when people begin to acknowledge you not to play it down but to stand forthright and be in agreement when people see you that takes courage when people tell you you're amazing and you nod your head in agreement do you know how much courage it takes to nod your head in agreement when in the past people said you're amazing and you put your head down and downplay yourself it is a courageous act to be in agreement with the way God sees you it is an act of courage when you can then say about yourself the very things you will say about other people. Can you imagine how easy it is to heap praise upon other people and recognize other people's gifts, talents, abilities? We do it all the time. We tell people that all the time. But then we never turn those words on ourselves and begin to speak those words because we have courage for other people but lack confidence for ourselves all the time. But the courage it takes when someone comes up to you and says, you know what? You are amazing. And when you can muster the courage to say, you know what? You are absolutely right. And walk away without feeling that you've been arrogant or conceited. Why? Because if people knew the tears you had to get through to be in agreement with that, if people knew the sleepless nights, the restlessness, the turmoil, the internal rumblings, the warfare, if people knew what you had to go through to be able to look at yourself confidently and say, I love you, if people knew what you had to go through to be able to pat yourself on the back and to heap praise upon yourself, if people knew the clawing and scratching and digging through the pounds and miles of emotional rubbish that you've had to go through to get to that point, they never call you conceited or arrogant. They would be in a agreement about how courageous you are because of what it took to get there so beloved you celebrate you and don't think that the only reason you can celebrate are for the big things no let me flip that you got to one celebrate things big and small here's why you do more than you give yourself credit for you do more than you give yourself credit for. You are so looking for the big story or the big narrative or the big, the big drama of the things that you think you need to have a good story to celebrate. No, you just need to have a memory, a mouth, and the ability to know how amazing you are to celebrate. You celebrate one, the big things and the small things. In fact, when it comes to living and maintaining your sanity, ain't nothing a small thing. 
Everything is big. Everything that is accomplished by you and done by you that took your beating heart and your flowing blood and your moving and expanding lungs was a great thing. Everything you do is a reason to celebrate because you cannot take it for granted. I don't know about you, but I, don't, I, 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 I dare you. I dare you. The next time you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning and your feet hit the ground and you start moving, I dare you to celebrate that. I dare you to celebrate the steps that you took, the ability to stand up. I remember some years ago, I was in revival in Illinois, Champaign, Illinois. My son was with me. And I remember we were in the hotel room and I was resting before the revival I had to preach that day. And, and, and something strange happened. I was sleeping and I, and I, and I got up got ready to take a shower. I stepped down on the ground and I heard some of my knee pop. My knee swole up. It was great pain the rest of the day for most of the trip. And I realized in that moment that something as small as getting out the bed and standing up is a great accomplishment. You don't think so? Talk to folk who struggle with mobility. You don't think being able to take a deep breath is impressive? Talk to people on ventilators right now. You don't think the ability to talk is a big deal? Speak to some folk who had a stroke and have lost the capacity to fully communicate. No, there is no small thing when it comes to living. Everything is big. And that means that you then don't try to compare your celebration and the reason for your celebration with anybody else. I know people have great news and they celebrate that good news, but their great news is also your great news. And your great news don't have to be their great news. And your great news could be something you think is small, but guess what? It's your great news. That's why the old folks, I keep telling you, the old folks, the saints, they understood it when they would get up to testify. And they didn't talk about how God blessed me with a car or God gave me a new job or God gave me a house. They would say things like this. God woke me up this morning. God started me on my way. Put food on my table. See, these little things they understood. They could not take for granted. There was no moment of your living that escapes celebrating. I hope you caught that. There is no moment of your living that can escape celebrating. You celebrate, one, the big things and the small. But remember this, there are no small things when it comes to living. Everything is big. And what does that mean? Give yourself credit because you do more than you give yourself credit for. So celebrate the great things. And what are the great things? everything because there's no small things when it comes to living i gotta hope you hear that i say it again there are no small things when it comes to living so celebrate the great things and then second here's what you do beloved celebrate by yourself and with friends what does that mean? That means that you have to have the capacity to celebrate without an audience, that you have to have the ability to do what the psalmist even said, dance around that house, sing around the house, celebrate yourself, celebrate your life. You can do it all by yourself. You can have the capacity to celebrate those sacred and significant moments in your life, which is every day, and you can do that. You have to then create the time to celebrate with you. You have to inject things in your daily routines that make you happy, that remind you to celebrate. In fact, there are moments every day that you have to celebrate. You must inject those moments in your daily routines. You have routine. We all have routines. We get up, go to the bathroom. Maybe somebody goes eat. This person gets coffee. I don't know what it is. But have you ever injected celebration in your daily routine by yourself? You inject celebration. You make sure, you schedule it, you time it. You tell yourself, before I leave the house at 8.52, I will celebrate myself. I will thank God for who I am and for how God has made me. Do you understand how powerful that is? When you schedule celebration of yourself before you leave the house every day, because here's the thing, if you do it before you leave the house, I promise you there'll be moments along the course of the day that you find yourself wanting to celebrate things about you. But if you can start at home celebrating yourself, oh my God. And then here's the thing, celebrate with yourself and with friends. Let me tell you what I learned. A few weeks ago, we were in, in, uh, in California, and we had a weekend of activities, and we had a brunch on Sunday, and we together watched the virtual service from the second Sunday of this month of November 
And we were there in California watching the service. And, and of course, the series was Secret of Celebrating Yourself. And then one of the folk who were there, one of the FCBC people, had to leave. And she left to go meet up brunch with some friends. She contacted me later on that evening. She said, Pastor Mike, so I got to tell you how much in alignment your sermon was today. She said, I got to the brunch and my friend told some of us, it was a small group of us, that she had just got a major promotion. In her words, she had really leveled up in life. Something major had happened. And she said that she wanted to set a date with her and four of her friends to celebrate. But she wanted the celebration not to just be about what she had done, but what they all had done and were doing. When was the last time you had not a birthday party, but a celebration party? Where you took time and you called friends together, you sent out invitations to do what? We're going to celebrate. Join me in celebrating what God is doing in my life and join me in celebrating me. You see, that sounds strange. You know why it sounds strange? Because we're not used to celebrating ourselves the way we think we need to have a special occasion. Well, it has to be a birthday or some major promotion or some graduation. No. How about this? You survived one more day. You made it one more day. And that's worthy of celebration. So in order to celebrate one, you have to celebrate things great and small. And then you realize that when it comes to living, there's no small thing. So you're celebrating what? Everything. The next thing you ought to do to celebrate you, you ought to celebrate by yourself and with friends. And can I pause for a second? Maybe that's a way we can determine who are the real friends in our life. Those who are able to celebrate with us without trying to intrude on our celebration with their stuff. I know we're going to celebrate, but maybe that's it. Maybe that one of the ways we continue to sustain celebration and having a celebratory attitude is making making sure that we surround ourselves with people who are not so full of themselves that they don't mind pausing to celebrate their friends. And when was the last time, I'm going to say it again, when was the last time you sent out invitations to celebrate just being alive? In fact, I challenge you. I challenge you to do this. Whoever your friends are, your tribe, your squad, once a quarter, come together, all of you, and have a celebration party. And at that party, all of you talk about the things that you need to celebrate in your life on that night. And it don't have to be no grand story, no great narrative, no big breakthrough. But once a quarter, four times a year, can you imagine when you have a habit of celebrating, you get together for brunch, you get together for drinks, you get together for for dinner get together to celebrate one another once every quarter and guess what happens when you start doing that you'll create new patterns new routines and new ways of enjoying one another's company because each person in that crew goes around the table and shares what they're celebrating about themselves and when you do that you create a whole tribe of folk who are cultivating the capacity to celebrate not only their friends but themselves I remember when we were sitting there in California, Jasmine, last last, few weeks ago, and we were in the circle, the people who came out to the watch party and the brunch, we gathered in the circle, and myself and Pastor Dez led a conversation, and there was one of the folk there, I won't call her name, she knows who she is, she's probably watching, And, and, and the whole weekend, she was helpful, she was showing up to help us set up, she would get there a little early to volunteer, whatever she, we needed, she would help. She was that same kind of person when she was here in New York before she went to L.A. And she was working here, helping us out in the media department. Well, that day we had been together Saturday morning, Saturday night, and Sunday afternoon. And this celebrating herself hit her hard. And she said in that circle, she said, well, I, I, I feel compelled to celebrate myself. And I just want to say that last week I got an Emmy. And we sat there like, what? She said it so casually. And we all started cheering and celebrating like that was a big deal. And all of a sudden I saw this big smile on her face. It was a big deal. But she, I don't know why, maybe she downplayed it. Maybe she thought it was a much, but she did that. And all of a sudden when she shared it, the entire group started celebrating. That's what it is. When you begin to share the accomplishments, the things you've done with people who you feel safe with and care, it becomes a praise party of celebrating yourself 
and the people you care for. So celebrate the great things and everything is great because there's nothing small when it comes to living. Celebrate by yourself. Celebrate with friends. And then can I tell you this? Schedule celebration. I already said, take time in your routine, but here's what I also want to push you to. Do things to make sure you stop, pause, reflect, and celebrate. Sometimes it means taking a mental health day from work and staying home and just reflecting and reorganizing. Sometimes it means breaking that routine. Sometimes it means taking yourself on a date. Sometimes it means sending flowers to yourself. Sometimes it means going shopping for a gift for who? For you. It means dressing up to go out with who? With yourself. It means doing those things that are necessary to schedule the celebration in your life. I know it sounds strange, but when was the last time, I think I said this on the, on, the, on the midweek motivation, when was the last time you got all dressed up to take yourself out? And there were people saying, well, I'd do it, I'd do it, but it wasn't everybody because we don't always do that. When was the last time you went on flowers.com and ordered some flowers and had them delivered to your house and the card said, to me, from me? Those things may seem strange, but my God, watch this. When you have cultivated the capacity to celebrate yourself, you won't find yourself slowly drawn in to the addiction for affirmation because you've learned the skill to affirm and validate yourself. You don't lose yourself in other people's praise and in other people's recognition because you know how to shower your own self with praise and how to shower your own self with accolades. And you know how to pour into your own self. You know how to recognize your own self. Why? Because when you can celebrate yourself, you don't even get jealous of other folks for what they're doing because you start wondering if other people know how to celebrate themselves the way you know how to celebrate yourself. No, beloved. The ability to celebrate you and to acknowledge you and to lean in to you is a beautiful thing. There's no need to downplay celebrating you. There's no reason to be ashamed of celebrating you. My God, do you know all the things you've gone through? Yes, you do. To make it right where you are. There were times where you were teetering on the brink of emotional collapse. You made it. Celebrate that. There were moments where you felt all alone and lonely until you discovered that you could be the life of your own party. Celebrate that. There were moments where you had to wear the mask and pretend, but beneath the pretentiousness was deep grieving and pain and hurt. But now you've learned to bloom where you're planted and to find joy in your being. Celebrate that. You used to be that person who, when people saw you, you always spoke in ways that affirmed misery. But now you speak in ways that confirm your own majesty. (laughs) Celebrate that. You deserve it. And for these four weeks, if you don't get anything else, know this, you are worthy of all the love and beauty and joy and peace and wonder that comes your way. It is good to be you. It is amazing to be you. And why not be happy about it? Again, the ability to do that cuts against all the narratives that want to deplete you. Stop depleting yourself and stop diminishing yourself and stop robbing yourself and start celebrating yourself. Say it again. Because you are worthy. Plain and simple. You are worthy. In fact, lean into that phone, that laptop, that TV. 
close your eyes for a second and just take an intentional breath. Take that deep breath and release it. And then just softly whisper to your spirit, I am worthy. I am worthy. Say it until a conviction rises up in your spirit. I am worthy. Speak it with an assurance and confidence that has been earned through the struggle and the strife. I am worthy. I begin to walk like I'm worthy and talk like I'm worthy and behave like I'm worthy and will not allow myself to be pulled down to levels that are beneath my significance. I am worthy. You are worthy, beloved. So make me a promise that you will celebrate yourself in this year throw a party before the year is over celebrating you invite some friends to come and celebrate one another because you are worthy come on let's pray God thank you for this day thank you God for this time God, if we're going to praise you, if, if we're going to praise you for your wondrous acts and your mighty deeds, God, we got to praise you for ourselves, for ourselves. Thanking you for making us and thanking you for creating us and everything that has been created, everything that breathes. If we have to praise you, we got to be able to praise you for creating us. God, thank you. Thank you. I praise you, God, for making me. I praise you, God, that there's no one like me. I thank you, God, that I am fearfully, wonderfully made. I glorify you, oh God, that you've made me with all this splendor and rareness and uniqueness. God, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. No longer will I be held captive by narratives that are not true about me I am the beloved of God your spirit God rests on me and in me you find favor oh, why because I'm worthy I'm worthy God thank you for hearing us and thank you for seeing us and thank you for listening to us this is our prayer. In your name we pray. And we say, Amen. Amen, beloved. Listen, thank you for joining us.